Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kane's independent media production. Today, we're continuing our journey through the decades with the 50s and the birth of rock and roll. Until now, we've largely been talking about jazz music and jazz sounds because for the first few decades of the century, that was the pop music. It was the alternative music. It was the dance music. It was, generally speaking, what people were listening to for recreation until we get into the late 40s and especially the 50s with the birth of some new styles that were mixing with other things happening in music, resulting in rock and roll growing out of that time period. Like a lot of periods before that, the music was dictating things about the sizes of the drums, the tuning of the drums, muffling we're going to start talking about a little bit, and also general choices about what to play to facilitate the music in terms of style and, and what you're hitting. Now, let's listen to each individual drum, we'll talk about what's going on here, and then we'll hear them in some contexts. Snare sounds in this era, pretty widely variable. There are high pitch, low pitch, dark, bright, you know, but at the end of the day, they're all snare drums. I think that it was just like with jazz and a lot of other things, personal preference, people had ideas about what a good snare sound was. We're using our old Gretsch today. It's giving us old sounds. It's making us happy here. Now, moving to the toms, you can hear the sort of jazz origin of these sounds, but in rock and roll, the pitches of the drums started to go down a little bit. We're still looking for a dry sound, an articulate sound. People aren't swinging for the fences again just yet. These are smaller groups, four or five people a lot of the time. So the drums need to not sustain forever. They need to not make a really definitive pitch that's going to clash with things, all of that stuff. In particular, with these drums today, little inside scoop. I really pitched the rezos down a lot on these today. It's almost like, as we've talked about in the past, an inverted modern tuning. We're talking about like the batter is like a fourth higher than the rezo. Finally, with the bass drum, this is sort of the big variable in the kit today. I brought my 20 inch Gretsch round badge kick. Um, it's a little later, it's the 60s, but it is similar construction to what things were going on then, and it's all original and intact. We're using full heads on both sides, single ply coated front and back. We have put a pillow in the drum. This is the first instance of musics where either by muffling or by tuning, the players were going for a shorter, punchier, thuddier kind of sound. We're not quite into the era of taking the front head off and really making the thing totally dead. But if you go and look at photos from this era, you don't see a ton of close miking. You'll see a bass drum mic sometimes, but the main thing is we're still dealing with full heads on both sides, but we're not looking for a big boom anymore. We're looking for a punch that's giving us a strong downbeat and charging through the groove.
Now going backward a little bit, the thing that we think of as the backbeat has moved around the set over these decades. And at times it's been cross stick, at times it's been all over the place, including the hi-hat on two and four and a lot of jazz that's sort of serving the purpose of the backbeat or the afterbeat, as they refer to it sometimes. At this point now, we're starting to hear square hitting it in the center of the snare drum backbeats in some shuffle grooves where in the past everything was getting driven more by the hi-hat on two and four and then the ride cymbal pattern, either the traditional jazz one or some sort of version of that. Additionally, you will hear four on the floor bass drum in music from this era. You'll also hear music where the kick is on one and three and the snare is opposite on two and four, which is an even more modern sort of interpretation of the bouncing back and forth between a low sound and a high sound to kind of get the hump in the groove and push it forward. This is also an era where, for a while, we were seeing in jazz a movement away from the hi-hat as the ride instrument to the ride cymbal being the primary ride instrument for a long time. Rock and roll got excited about using the hi-hat for timekeeping. It's a drier sound, it has a lot of options in it, it can be very loud even then when they were using thinner cymbals, and it meshes with the snare drum in a really nice way without ringing a ton and taking up as much space in the music. There's a little more room to dial in just how much air it's taking up just by pressure on the pedal. One of the things that I think of as particularly fascinating about this sort of early era in rock music and also country and other things that were growing out of this time period is that coming from jazz of the time, bebop and different things like that, there was a lot of fills and a lot of information in the drum set. And when you move to this music, suddenly there's not a lot of fills. Suddenly you don't hear the toms that much. You'll hear them just as little punctuations, but there's not a lot of display of technique. There's not a lot of display of ideas. It's moving back to a support role that's super important. And in particular, it's important for it to stay fairly static throughout the tune so that you can focus on the vocal, focus on the harmony, and get into the song rather than having the drums be as much of an equal sort of contributor to the musical information that's happening. In that this is the 50s and we're still in the jazz era, you're still hearing symbols that people were using for jazz. And the reason for this is that at this time, there was no such thing as a rock drummer. All the drummers were jazz drummers because that was the music that was happening, whether it was show music or a big band or small groups, whatever it might be. Jazz was the music of the day. And as bebop started to get codified and then hard bop and avant-garde things grew out of that, this became a new sort of pop music that was just for every man on the street. You didn't need to know anything about music. You could just enjoy that the beat was danceable, which is similar to how jazz started out in the first place. It was dance music and then grew into a larger thing with a lot more personalities and different kinds of directions that it liked to go in. Notable artists that we were listening to today to get some ideas for things to demo included Bill Haley and the Comets, Elvis, uh, Little Richard, we listened to, oh gosh, uh, so many things. There was a lot of mixtures of different sort of soul and folk musics into this as well, and a huge prevalence of contribution from the African American community, again, giving a lot of background, a lot of vibe, and a lot of sort of... Um, new directions in the music based on the things that they were writing and that they were excited about in their small communities, which, because it became popular, went everywhere and ultimately became the new pop music for the whole nation and then kind of onto the rest of the world. In addition to bringing sounds and ideas from jazz music, another maybe larger contributor to rock and roll in general is blues 
and rhythm and blues musics that were already occurring before what we think of as rock and roll was even a thing that had a name. This music is African-American music. It was around concurrently with jazz for a long time. And as these things all ran together and gave us what we think of as rock and roll in the 50s, lots of other genres, rockabilly, lots of things grew out of that. And we were surprised to discover today that a lot of the music that at least I thought was actually from the 60s was earlier. It was in the 50s. And it was at a time when this was brand new stuff. It was super innovative. Nobody knew what they were doing. They just knew that they loved it. And they did whatever they had to do in the studio and also on stage to make the music that they wanted to make. And it it must have been a really exciting time. Another important thing to keep in mind is that music was getting louder during this decade in the context of pop and rock and roll music. So you had the introduction of the electric bass, you had the introduction of people overdriving their guitar amps and learning about distortion and different things like that. You had people going after sounds that were functionally inappropriate given the gear that they had. And a lot of what we love about that, a lot of the innovation was through pure experimentation, young guys hearing a sound and going, I like that because my dad hates it. <laughs> and, then, and then running with it. And, you know, if they hadn't done that or if the technology had been different, everything that we think of as rock and roll sounds would be different today. Additionally, and this was the really big mind blower for me, I had no idea about this. A lot of the technology that we think of today as quasi-modern recording techniques and also modern recording equipment came out of Europe post-Second World War. We're talking about German condenser microphones, we're talking about much more advanced consoles, things that were invented over there that we straight up didn't know about or had not gotten around to understanding back here in the States. So when you listen to a lot of this music, you're hearing people on the engineer side experiencing insane amounts of innovation at the same time as the musicians are trying to make something new and exciting for themselves. The confluence of those things is how we get this decade that gave us so much that even now modern bands, and you can probably guess a few, are really intensely back-referencing this stuff because it is so important and it does define pop music and rock music even today. It also bears mentioning that bebop, hard bop, these things didn't disappear when rock and roll started to be developed. Tons of innovation was still happening in the jazz community. Some of the most amazing records that we have to look at from this really hyper accelerating period of jazz development come from the 50s and 60s. A lot of my favorites for sure. And because of that music just pushing so many boundaries, and then this music starting to become opposite that in the pop realm. It was a time where every genre available was splintering into subgenres, interacting with each other, taking ideas from one side of the aisle to the other, and giving us one of the most creative decades in American music ever. At this point, we would really like to encourage you to do some of your own research on the internet and elsewhere to learn about this decade and other decades of music as well, specifically with reference to how they intersect with all the other decades, including the ones that you lived in, ones that came before, and getting a sense of how these languages are still alive. They were alive then, they're alive now, and this music even that we're talking about today is still affecting things that are written today. Even if it's just the choice of like which guitar to use or a vintage amp or just what you listen to that inspires the songs that you write. This is still modern music, it's still important music, and I mean, just the parallel between like Little Richard and John Bonham, like, you, you can't deny that. All right, that about wraps it up for today. Thank you for coming with us on the 50s and the birth of rock and roll. This was a ton of fun and weirdly challenging (laughs) to play and uh, got to hear a lot of new music today too as well. Well, new to me, definitely not new music, but new to me. And if you like what you heard, please like, comment, and subscribe and hit the notification bell to hear about all of our new videos. 
please hop over to the Patreon through the link below and check out the tiers there as well, specifically for the Symbol series. We're really excited about that, have a lot of new stuff going on there. I would love to know, we would love to know, if you go after old rock and roll sounds in music that you're making today and the choices that you make to do that, whether it's how many mics to use, what drums to use, what heads to use, anything like that that's really era specific and in the rock and roll realm because it is very popular right now and people are using modern stuff to do it, vintage stuff, the vintage market is out of control. We would love to hear your stories. 